Hello again. Welcome to chapter six, which is all about listening. So I hope that you have already gone through Learn Smart for chapter six, or bare minimum have read through chapter six so that all of this will be familiar as I add on to it. Um, one of the first things the chapter covers is what is the difference between listening and hearing? Listening is an active process that is completely engaged and um, in which you assimilate and evaluate information and sometimes you prepare to respond as you're listening. Um, and hearing is a passive act. Hearing is um, simply the physical act of the membranes in your ears receiving the vibrations or in the case of many human beings um, using your eyes to watch sign language or using your eyes to read um, it's just a physical process of being able to receive certain kinds of information whether it's verbal text sign language etc um, hearing is just one of the stages of listening that physical ability to absorb right? Even Helen Keller, who was amazing, nailing the hearing despite not literally being able to hear. She physically could absorb information. So the other steps of listening beyond hearing are remembering, interpreting, evaluating, and responding. Hearing is a little bit complex because as we just covered, there are many ways to do it. Same with remembering, and this might be particularly valuable for an online class. Remembering can involve repeating. You are more likely to effectively listen and remember information that's been repeated. Um, it's why advertisers sometimes buy two ads in one commercial break, because if they repeat their information, you're a little bit more likely to remember and listen to it. Um, active listening repeating something back after you hear it is a really good way to remember and listen um, when someone gives you instructions take two lefts and then turn right at the giant oak tree if you physically say back to that person take two lefts and then a right at the giant oak tree it is automatically more incorporated into your brain the same works for note taking instead of repeating it back to someone repeating it to yourself on paper. Typing it, a little bit less effective, but even if you know that you're never gonna have an exam in which you need to rely on your notes, the physical act of taking notes helps you listen and remember, which seems silly, but it's true that even if you're not gonna have to review your notes for an exam, just making the notes, just creating them will stick it into your brain better and make you a better listener unless you get distracted with your notes and are making doodles, in which case that is not as helpful. Um, meditating or studying, um, those also help. That if you do have an exam, probably don't just make some notes, probably review them as well. It falls in with repeating, um, but even if you don't physically have something to repeat, if you um, pause and think about something, or if you're somebody who can control your dreams, um, anything that is a mindful reflection on something that you're trying to remember and listen to increases your listening ability. Um, practice. Um, if it is a skill, not just a piece of information, um, practice. Anything that involves either neural pathways or muscle memory, if you practice it, um, you are much more likely to be able to um, remember later. Um, emotional connection is present in remembering things that you listen to. We all tend to remember things better from when we had a heightened emotional state, whether it was disappointment or excitement. If you can attach an emotion to something that you're listening to or processing, it will make you a better listener and remember. The emotions actually help. They heighten your long-term memory of that situation. Um, or mnemonics. Mnemonics are, um, Things like acronyms for remembering an entire phrase, the colors, the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, or the letters assigned to um, a treble clef, every good boy does fine. Um, any of those things, th those little tricks to help you remember an entire phrase or concept um, are mnemonics. Um, so after you've accomplished hearing, physically absorbing the information and remembering, 
trying to latch on to what it is you've listened to, um, then we have to do interpreting. Um, and interpreting involves evaluating the source of the information. You know, is this a reliable source? Do I believe CNN? Do I believe Fox? Do I believe NPR? Evaluate the source. So as you're physically absorbing the information and trying to remember the information that's been given to you, you also have to interpret. Um, it's checking for emphasis. What is the speaker emphasizing? What is the frame they're using? What order are they talking about the events? Um, what is their facial expression doing? What is their tone of voice doing? Do I have a history with this person? Am I listening empathetically? Or am I listening for facts? Which style of listening do I want to do? That all affects our interpretation. And then we have to evaluate. Do we believe what we just absorbed? You know, um, we have to remember it so that we can interpret it. And then once we've interpreted what they're trying to say, do we want to buy what they're selling? Are we picking up what they're laying down? We have to evaluate what we already understand them to be putting forth. And then finally, we can respond. And we'll get to responding more in a little bit because it can be a problem for listening. It is also required for a good listener. So we really have to balance how much absorbing and interpreting and evaluating and responding we're doing as the stages of listening. Um, because if we're not responding, that makes us a terrible listener. Think about the last time somebody didn't respond when you said something important. It doesn't go well. Um, but think about a time that you were trying to talk to someone about something and they responded too quickly and didn't get all the information. So we are going to have to figure out how to balance all these stages of listening, physically absorbing, remembering, um, interpreting, evaluating, and finally responding. Um, there are lots of ways of responding that can make it either fabulous or horrible. Um, back channeling. It's one that's not particularly great. Not as a sole listening strategy. Back channeling means when you do the fake listen, when instead of actually um, evaluating the information, you are just going, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. It's kind of fake listening. That back channeling, putting someone on your back channel while your active mind thinks about a different channel, not super great. Um, stonewalling, when you just straight up don't listen, walk away, glaze over. Um, or if we spend too much time analyzing, that's not a great plan either. Because instead of analyzing right away, we should in fact maybe spend more time interpreting. If I start to analyze someone's first facial expression and I miss their next three facial expressions, I did too much time evaluating and not enough interpreting. Um, paraphrasing, making something overly simplistic after we hear it. Um, or we can emphasize. Empathetic listening tends to go very well. Um, almost anywhere, because in life we often have someone who needs our empathy, either a friend who's relying on it or a boss who needs us to not just understand the directions, but their intent. All of these things come into play, um, including finally taking action. Action can be a really great response, really effective way to show you were listening, but we can't do it too soon. So many times someone in life has said to one of us, oh gosh, I'm just having this really horrible day and this happened and that happened and here's how it's going. And some of us tend to jump right into problem solving and say, well, why don't we do this? Let's do X, Y, Z and we'll solve ABC. And that's not really what they wanted. So empathetic listening is a really important style. Um, in addition to taking action. So we're gonna go through these lists again and try to uh, balance all the different kinds of listening that we should do. Um, and another big thing that we'll talk about much more another week is that culture affects listening. Um, it affects how quickly you're supposed to take action. Um, one's culture affects how empathetic we're supposed to be. How often are we supposed to repeat phrases back? How blunt should we be? What should our tone of voice be when we're responding? So all of these things that make an important listener are very culturally dependent. Um, 
sometimes even generationally. You can think about how your listening and conversation style changes with your grandparents versus with your friends, or um, how a conversation and listening style is different in the South than it is in Wisconsin or in California or in New York or in Paris or South America. All of these things very much affect our listening and we just need to be aware of it, which we'll spend a whole week talking about. Um, barriers to listening. Um, in addition to not recognizing what we as listeners need to be doing, there are some other valid reasons that make it really hard to listen. Um, some of those barriers are really obviously noise. Almost anything can count as noise in a situation. Um, if we were physically in a classroom and the door was open and people were walking past, that literal noise would be a problem. Um, or music or no music. Music helps some people listen, and for some people it's a distraction. So this literal noise can be a big barrier to listening, and it gets better if we're aware of it. Um, sensory needs. Um, if a room is too hot, if it smells funny, if there's a wind, anything that affects our senses, how we physically feel, can interfere with our listening. Um, the topic can interfere with our listening. If right now I switched to talking about something that was not required <laughs> um, for you to graduate from your program, it might be much harder to listen. Even if this isn't our favorite topic, we don't love communications, it's better than if I um, immediately switched to botany right now. It would be much harder to listen to a botany discussion right now than it would about communications because the topic would drastically change. Um, and of course, it's always easier to listen to our favorite topics and we have to practice listening to topics that are not our favorites. Um, listening style um, can be effective. Um, some people love to sit on the floor and listen to a story, a fictional story being read. That style would not work for other people. Some people would prefer to be sitting up straight in a chair at a desk um, having someone speak the information. Others prefer visual to go along with it. Um, and as long as we recognize our style and tune in to when we're having trouble listening based on style, we can do a better job of accommodating the ways in which we have to listen, even when they're not our favorites. Um, organization. If a speech is not organized, it is really hard to listen to. We are right now following the basic outline of chapter six. If I was jumping back and forth between chapters or the end and the beginning and the middle of the chapter, it would be much harder to follow. Um, even if this is a little bit hard to follow because it's dry and online instead of in person, at least it's organized in the same way as the chapter in the book. Um, information overload. We have covered already so much information and because I know that that affects listening, I don't expect you to memorize or remember all of it off the top of your head. Um, information overload happens when there's just a vast amount of information to be covered. And when we're listening and speaking, we just have to be aware that sometimes there's more than we can even potentially remember. And that sometimes it's necessary and we have to take notes, or we have to come back to the source and recheck it all again. And that's okay. Because informational overload is a very real thing. Um, literal audio volume, in addition to uh, verbosity and volume of topics covered on um, the audio volume, physically how high or low the audio is, can make a big difference. If I started whispering, it'd be a lot harder to listen to all of this. Whereas if you talk in a normal human voice, it's maybe at least in the middle range of okay to listen to. Um, if someone's yelling at you, we automatically don't listen as well. That literal audio actually affects, for most of us, affects how we listen. Um, rebuttal tendency is a big factor. If we spend the entire time that we're listening trying to come up with a rebuttal, if we're so anxious to respond that we're skipping the part where we actually absorb and evaluate the information, we're not going to be a very good listener. And it's tempting sometimes, especially when there's an election coming up, to have a conversation in which we are ready to rebuttal before the speaker is done talking. Um, so we have to, as listeners, be really aware of that. Um, familiarity with the person who's speaking. The more familiar we are with a topic, 
the more familiar we are with a presenter, the more likely we are to listen. And this becomes a giant problem because if the person speaking has really important information but doesn't look the same as us, doesn't speak the same as us, or is on an unfamiliar topic, we tune out. We psychologically as humans do not do as good of a job listening to unfamiliar people or topics. So again, we have to be really aware of it because we would miss lots of important information if we as humans were accidentally only paying attention to familiar people talking about familiar topics. Um, and then culture. We will talk about culture of listening all next week. What kinds of listening are expected, how frequently listening is expected, um, what the style of response is, what vocabulary is used, which language is used. Um, this all affects listening and communication very deeply. Um, so to test your listening right now, we're going to do a little homework experiment. So in just a moment, I want you to pause this and you're going to go to the YouTube video of Daniel Radcliffe um, performing Alphabet Aerobics by Black Alicious. So we're going to watch him perform it first. So just listen as carefully as you can to Daniel Radcliffe performing. And I'm going to count to three. And then we're going to test how much you can remember. One, two, three. Okay, now that you've watched Daniel Radcliffe rap and you feel a little bit differently about Harry Potter, pause this again and I want you to write down or type as many of the lyrics as you can remember. So do it. Open up a new document or a page in your notebook and write down as many lyrics as you can remember from Daniel Radcliffe. One, two, three. Okay, so how much did you remember? Alphabet aerobics is really fast, and unless you are a wonderful, wonderful variety of nerd and already knew all the lyrics, I'm guessing that you couldn't come up with all of them. Could you come up with even a little bit of each letter? Did that organization help your listening enough that you knew that even if you couldn't come up with the specifics, at least there was an alphabet involved? Right? The organization helped a little bit. So let's see what else we can do to improve the listening. Let's try it again. And this time, it's actually going to be Black Alicious. And you're going to have the lyrics on the page. They are going to scroll past. So pause right now. Go watch the video of the same song by Black Alicious with the lyrics on the screen. One, two, three. How did that go? Right now, pause again and see how many lyrics you can add to that original page. You can use the same page, you don't have to start over, but now that you've seen the lyrics going past, let's see if your listening was any improved. See how many you can add. One, two, three. Okay, did you get to add a couple? You could add a couple in there because you saw the words go past, right? Okay, so one more. That was still pretty fast with Blackalicious. Now we're gonna watch it slow down with the lyrics. One more try. This is one more try to see how many lyrics you can pull from this song. One, two, three. You're back. Okay, how was that? Was it better the third time? Have you collectively added more to what you were able to listen to as we proceeded? And what were the factors that did that for you? Did the initial alphabet organization help in the first place? And then did seeing it help? Did taking notes help? Did the repetition help? Because we've seen it three times now. It might be stuck in your head, which would be, you know, a success for your listening skills. And you can start to begin to see some of the elements that helped you listen. Did you have to turn down other audio that you had going? Um, did you have to close a door? Did you have to focus? Did you have to um, turn off your tendency to rebuttal? Um, was it unfamiliar so you had to pay more attention? 
start noticing these factors. Listening in this class will be very important, especially because we're doing it online. So we are going to have to practice our listening skills, whether it involves text or audio. Um, other things that improve our listening, in addition to practicing and recognizing the kinds of noise that we have to avoid, um, we need to hear what isn't said. Um, when I referred to that as a homework exercise, you may have heard, I'm going to get points for this, which is what I intended, but we're not actually going to do points for that. It was just an exercise. But an important part of listening is listening for things that are not literally actually said. Intentions, implications, things you might have to pay attention to later based on what's being said now. Um, we need to be aware of our confirmation bias that we're more likely to hear the side of the argument with which we're familiar. It's just like that familiarity bias that we have, is that um, if two complete sides of an argument are presented, which one do you think we listen to better and remember better afterwards? The one we expected to be true. We, even if an answer about A and B are both true, is the answer given, we're more likely to only hear either the A or the B with which we already understood and sympathized. Um, we need to be a skeptic. It is okay to evaluate for sources. Um, you know that we are working from our textbook, right? So you know that most of my sourcing, most of my backup for this class is the book that we're working our way um, from cover to cover. If I didn't have that source, if I wasn't referring you to Harlow or Maslow or Daniel Radcliffe or Blacklicious, you could say, um, I'm a little bit skeptical of who wrote that song or who came up with a pyramid of the hierarchy of needs. And that would be really valid. We should be a little bit skeptical. We should not believe everything we hear just because we're trying to be empathetic. It is important that we evaluate. Um, and we have to notice which kinds are most useful for school and work, because that's ultimately what WTC wants us to do, is to get better at being a listener in school and at work. Um, we have to know ourselves. We have to know if we work better on a schedule. Do I work better in the morning, at night? Do I work better with the door open or closed? And if I can't have those preferences, what can I do about it? We have to understand about ourselves what helps our listening be really effective. So we have to know ourselves. Um, we have to anticipate. We have to look ahead on the syllabus. We have to hear me say that I don't do quizzes, but that that means you have to turn learn smart sections in on time. Um, we have to anticipate that we're gonna be busy on Saturday, so I have to do most of my schoolwork on Thursday. All these things we have to anticipate. Um, we have to perspective take. Um, we have to be able to put ourselves in the speaker or the communicator's shoes so that we can better anticipate and empathize and understand what they're saying. If there's a gap in a speaker's communication, perspective taking may help us fill in the information that we were missing. Perspective taking, very important. Um, practice, practice, practice. None of us are great listeners in every single setting. There are bazillions of factors that affect our listening. These are just a few of them. And as long as we are practicing and being aware and repeating our ability to try to listen in unfavorable situations, to put ourselves in favorable listening situations. We have to do these over and over again before we get really good at it. And um, even on those days, if it's too hot or cold, a lot of it may go over our heads. So chapter six, there's the basic context of chapter six. Um, listening is gonna be present all throughout this course. Um, and it's a basic human function that we have to have to communicate well. So we're going to try to practice it online together for this whole course. So I hope that listening to this went well, despite the information overload or despite stylistic preferences. Um, review chapter six, head over to the discussion and your journal entry.